come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be reviewing and paging through Dungeons and Dragons Original Adventures Reincarnated Volume 1 Into the Borderlands from Goodman Games. Are these two classic converted adventures deserving of a place in your 5e D&D collection? For his time simply not been kind to this pair of basic Dungeons and Dragons adventures. Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. The old school for the New Year's celebration continues to rock on. All throughout January, I am focusing on role-playing games that have an old school vibe. And to be honest, you don't get much more old school than basic Dungeons and Dragons. So today I am going to review and share a bit of a page through of Dungeons and Dragons Original Adventures Reincarnated Volume 1 Into the Borderlands from Goodman Games. The original adventures were written by Mike Carr and Gary Gygax. These 5e conversions have been put together by Chris Doyle and Tim Wadzinski. The cover artwork comes from B2, the Keep on the Borderlands, and it is a work from Jim Rosloff. And the back cover, which we'll see in just a moment, comes from, I do believe, if I remember correctly, it's a later print run of B1, In Search of the Unknown, from the artist Darlene. So, this 384-page hardcover is available right now. It carries an MSRP of $49.95. It is not available in PDF, nor will it be available in PDF. Let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got Into the Borderlands. So this is an homage to B1 in search of the unknown and B2 to keep on the borderlands. And of course, 5e conversions for these also so we get reproductions of the original modules as well as the 5e conversions a few things i do want to mention before we dive on in first off this is not a review copy that was provided by the publisher there happens to be someone who's a big fan of the channel as well as the gaminggang.com who likes my role-playing game coverage and they sent along all six current volumes of the original adventures reincarnated line so very very cool they do not want to be identified they want to stay anonymous so an anonymous patron well i know who it is but they've asked me not to reveal their name provided all six volumes so very very cool so i'm very excited to share these with you i already did a page through on the live stream that I do, the Gaming Gang Dispatch. If you'd like to get an even deeper dive into what's inside this book, by all means, you can also check that out as well. I'm going to stay picture in picture up here in the corner. So I am going to be cutting off a little bit of the upper left portion of this book as we take a peek through. Should also mention, we're not going to look at each and every page of this. I'm going to skip through a lot of it. But I uh, just want to, you know, give you a feel for it and show you what's in the book and kind of discuss some of my thoughts about it. All right, let's jump to the back. And I'll read a little bit. I'm not going to read everything from the back of this, but Into the Borderlands, the Borderlands, an untamed wild region far flung from the comforts and protection of civilization. A lone fortified keep is the only bastion of good desperately striving to maintain the forces of chaos at bay. For some reason, that sentence just doesn't seem to be structured correctly. But evil is everywhere, lurking in dark caves, 
petted swamps and forlorn forests, bands of cutthroat brigands and ruthless tribes of humanoids eager to clash with the forces of good roved the region. The borderlands hold many secret wondrous locations, and the opportunities for fame, prestige, and fortune are plentiful. But equally abundant are the perils, risks, and challenges for those brave enough to explore the wilds. Sharpen your swords and axes, purchase your iron rations and tinderboxes, and don't forget at least one 10-foot pole. Adventure awaits those with the metal to confront chaos in the borderlands. Sweet! Let's jump on in. If you follow the gaming gang, if you've, if you've watched any of my live streams in the past few weeks as we have been enjoying the, uh, the old school for the new year, I said new, new school for the old year. Yes, the old school for the new year celebration. I've discussed that I only played Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. We never really played the basic D&D that came out, the box set that came out in 79, or the basic or expert box sets that came out as well. So I never owned these modules. I didn't own B1. I didn't own B2. I seem to recall taking a peek at B1 at one point, but I never owned it, never owned those box sets either. I, I take that back. I did own the Holmes box set, which some people refer to as like Blue Holmes because it was a blue box, but I didn't have the, uh, the others, the other box sets after that. So we get a few pages of kind of uh, a history uh, some thoughts looking back on various different designers' experiences with both B1 and B2. Luke Gygax, of course, Gary Gygax's son, Mike Merles. We get Harley Stroh, who, if you are a fan of Dungeon Crawl Classics, which is also from Goodman Games, no doubt you're familiar with Harley's fantastic adventures that he provides for that game system. And uh, there's an interview with Mike Carr. Who Mike Carr designed B1. And I have to chuckle because if you are not familiar with the history of both B1 and B2, but mainly B1, the reason why it was replaced in the basic sets is because they were having to pay Mike Carr royalties on every basic box set that was being sold because the adventure came with it. So the thought process was, well, if Gary writes the adventure, well, then we don't have to pay out any sort of royalties. So that's why B2 came along. Kind of kind of funny, kind of interesting. I, and I, you know, it was a business decision. So the uh, interview goes on for a little bit. Then we get into the reproduction of the module itself. And I'll be the first to say, I really love the fact that we do have the reproduction of both B1 and B2. One thing I'm not overly keen on is that it's got every print run of these modules, which, which inflates the page count. And in my opinion, makes the book a little more unwieldy at the gaming table. Because we've got, I mean, is there really a need to have all three print runs of B1 in here. There weren't that many changes that were made. Now, I will point out that uh, the later volumes kind of start getting away from that. We don't see every single print run reproduced in the book, and I do appreciate that a lot. But I do love the fact that we get the original adventure, both original adventures, I should say, and one of the reasons why is because you can kind of compare them to the 5e conversions, and it really drives home the difference in design mechanics between old D&D, &D, basic D&D, &D, and 5th edition. And I got to say, I still love my old school approach to role-playing games and running role-playing games and using common sense and not needing to roll dice every time you turn around and things like that. Something else I should mention, if you notice, the blue 
blueprint for the map. We get the same blueprint on the back cover as well. The reason why those maps that came on the back of the module covers were in that color is because Xerox copiers could not reproduce that color. So I was thought it was kind of funny. That was the reason why it was that color. So we'll get the original adventure. And those of you out there who recall basic D&D, there is that, that TSR font that they used for a vast majority of the basic and expert adventures. The font is a little bit different than the advanced Dungeons and Dragons releases. Not a, not a lot, but it is visually noticeable. So we're going to have quite a lot of paid space devoted to the original modules. And like I said, it is reproduced multiple times. And like I said, to me, I think it's kind of a waste of paid space. I could easily see this adventure having one of the additions reproduced and then the 5e conversion and shave off about 80 pages. And even if Goodman Games charged the same price, it would certainly be worth it. It's just, to me, it's overkill. It really is. It's just simply, to me, it's overkill. So one thing about B1 is, first of all, it's a dungeon crawl. And it's supposed to introduce dungeon masters to stocking a dungeon, populating a dungeon. Now, keeping in mind, at this point in time, dungeon ecology really didn't exist. So there wasn't a lot of uh, time and energy spent into making a plausible dungeon where it's like, okay, well, these, these creatures kind of coexist in this sort of ecosystem. Now it was just sort of like, yeah, okay, we'll throw giant rats in there and got giant spiders in there. We got goblins over there. We got some orcs over here. But the, uh, the way that this was set up was some of the rooms were already set up. They were keyed, but many of them were not. But then you had all of these entries that you could key your dungeon with. So everybody's dungeon would be different. And we get some stocked examples, and these are new. This, these are not from the original uh, module at all. These are brand new. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I thought that was kind of neat because when we get into the 5e conversion, it's already keyed. Everything's keyed. It's not asking you to create your own uh, dungeon layout by populating it with uh, pre-generated encounters and set pieces. So then we get into the keep on the borderlands. In the actual adventures themselves, there is no tie-in between the two of them. One thing I do like about the fifth edition conversion is that there is, there is easily a way to tie both of the adventures together. I like that quite a lot. So this is uh, B2. This is the adventure that Gary Gygax wrote to replace Mike Carr's adventure in the basic box set. And one aspect of this is uh, that, that people love is the keep because it gave the player characters kind of a base of operations that they could work out of. And it was detailed enough that the dungeon master could easily utilize the NPCs for uh to, to be helpful and they have available hirelings and so on and so forth one aspect of the adventure that i have always heard was was pretty goofy is with the caves of chaos you've got all these little caves they're all very short little delves all have different monsters and they all live within a very short distance of each other and really, once again, dungeon ecology, even like in that example, wilderness ecology really didn't come into play when these adventures were designed. And that does kind of carry over 
to the fifth edition conversion. So we're going to go through about 180 pages or so of just the reproduction of the adventures. Then once we get to page, well, I should say about 160. Then we get to page 182. This is where we start diving on into the 5e conversions of these two classic basic Dungeons and Dragons adventures. One aspect that I like is that there is right here advice for dungeon masters and it discusses the old school mentality of role playing games and of course using that old school mentality with 5e mechanics so we get into some of the basics about it talking about time resources and so on and so forth interestingly enough out of the six volumes that I've taken a peek at. Now, I have not read all six. I am actually in the midst of volume three of the series. This is the only volume that actually includes this sort of advice for the Dungeon Master. Keeping in mind, these adventures were designed for levels like one to three of basic D&D, where the other adventures outside of Let's see, Isle of Dread and Temple of Elemental Evil were designed for higher level characters. So that might be one of the reasons why they've shied away from including this kind of OSR advice for the Dungeon Masters in the other volumes. Well, you get a few pages of that. So what are these adventures about? Okay, so first of all, now personally out of the two adventures, I actually like the conversion for B1 in search of the unknown better than B2. And the reason is in search of the unknown is more of a traditional dungeon delve. And B2 is, is sort of a hodgepodge mashup of all these various different monsters. And once again, as I mentioned, that ecology just seems really weird to me. And I'll show you what I mean. So essentially what's going on in Search of the Unknown is the player characters learn of this stronghold of these two famed adventurers. There's uh, Rogaine, who's the fighter, and then there's Renee Zellwinger, who is the mage, or names like that. I'm kidding. It's Rogan and... Uh, Zillinger, Zillingar, something like that. And uh, the stronghold is called Quasquetan. Words along, pronunciation along that uh, respect there. So essentially, the player characters learn that these two famed adventurers, who actually could be evil, they might have been evil. You're not sure. It's kind of up to the dungeon master to decide on that, uh, have not been seen in a long, long time. So the player characters, of course, being the sorts that they are, want to go seek adventure and their, you know, fortune by checking out this stronghold. They have, they have an idea where it's at. So, and there's, there's different hooks to get the players started with this. Now, one of the ways that this ties together with B2 is if you want to start off with the keep on the borderlands first, they can learn of Quasquitan uh, while they're at the keep. And uh, I'll, I'll discuss that when we get into B2. Okay, it's Zeligar is the, is the wizard. But yes, it was, it's funny because I, I say Rogaine because somebody had said, when talking about uh, B1, they're like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're going in, you're, you're trying to find uh, the, uh, the fighter Rogaine or something. <laughs> it's like, no, I think it's Rogan. So here we get the, the breakdown. We get our uh, a 5e treatment here. So we got a bit of read aloud for each of the areas. I am not going to spoil it in case you don't know anything about this adventure. But as you can see, each of the areas is keyed. 
So you're not expected to populate this dungeon at all. In my opinion, I think this dungeon has just about everything a classic low-level dungeon delve would normally have in an old-school adventure. You've got interactivity with various uh, areas. You've got opportunities to parlay with some encounters. You've got uh, some... What I always like to have in dungeons is competition. I like... I like doing things to, to make the player characters realize that they're not the only ones who have learned of this place. Now, I might actually have uh, the remains of a party that came before them scattered around the dungeon, or there are times that I like to just introduce a rival party to the mix and uh, have fun with that. This should take a good number of sessions for the players to enjoy as well. We do get some new material, so we get some additional adventuring areas. There's a, a tower that was mentioned in the original adventure that is right here, additional encounters. So we get the lonely tower, so we get a breakdown of that. It's, it's a pretty small location. And uh, we get the Zeligar Sanctuary. We also get, uh, I was going to say, Rogan's Tomb. So these are other areas as well. Rogan's Tomb has uh, a lot of traps. They're pretty interesting. They're not overwhelming. So also we get a chapter devoted to keying the dungeon, if you would like. If you want to do it randomly. Then we get into the keep on the Borderlands, which is, Probably an adventure that has been played, I would take a guess, maybe the most ever in Dungeons and Dragons, because keeping in mind how many basic sets had this adventure in it. So this was where a lot of players kind of cut their teeth on D&D &D back in the day. This isn't a bad adventure. I like the adventure. It's fine. I could, I could really see fleshing it out quite a bit. Uh, like I said, there is the tie-in to the uh, In Search of the Unknown, where because there's an area here. Let's see if we get the, the map here. So we've got more wilderness encounters in that in this, too, that I do like. That's the Caves of Chaos. Okay, where is that map? Okay, here we go. So we've got the Cave of the Unknown right here, which in the original Keep on the Borderlands was uh, just another location with monsters. Here you can make the Cave of the Unknown actually Quisquastalon or whatever it's pronounced. Uh have that adventure right here. So that's why I like how it ties in together that way. There's also an NPC who ties in to this location as well, which uh, I could see having a really good time resolving that situation with your players. So then we get into the Caves of Chaos, and we actually have more caves added to the mix so it becomes an even stranger sort of wilderness uh, monster ecology. But one thing that I do like about B2 is that each of the caves could easily be played out in a session, maybe less than a session. You, your players might be able to, to finish up a couple of locations in a single sitting depending on how long you play for. I tend to play for a good amount of time. When I'm running role-playing games, usually anywhere from about six to eight hours is the norm with my group. So we tend to get more stuff done than, than other people who only play, you know, three hours, four hours. So I do like the new additions to the locations as well. So we get some new magic items. We get some new spells. Get new monsters, obviously enough. 
And we also get some non-player characters that you can utilize as pre-generated characters, or you can use them as hirelings, followers, what have you. And then another aspect I like is if you want to kind of speed up your character generation, depending on what character class your player characters are, you have uh, backpacks with equipment. And it also helps to provide your player characters with equipment that they would use in an old school setting, old school way of playing as well. And then we get the, a cover gallery to finish up. Here's that fifth edition fantasy. Uh, I'm not sure if Harley Stroh has written any adventures for, for 5e fantasy for Goodman Games. And then we get the Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, kind of promo in the back as well. And here we have the other maps in the blue, the, the blue that can't be re reproduced by Xerox copiers. Although I think, I got to be honest, I think this is a darker color. I think this is a darker blue. All right. That is Into the Borderlands, the first volume of Original Adventures Reincarnated from Goodman Games. Let's swing on over to the other camera because I'm going to share my final thoughts and give this a review score. So all in all, I really do like this first volume of Original Adventures Reincarnated. I like the fact that we get the original modules. I like the fact that we get the 5e conversion. And I actually was taking a peek at both and kind of comparing the two. And it's really, really jarring for somebody who grew up with AD and D and it's kind of jarring to see the, the actual mechanical mindset of the two different games. Whereas, you know, back in the old days, the old school way is player characters tell you what they're doing and the dungeon master decides, okay, well they use common sense. Okay. That, okay. That would make sense. If there's a possibility for failure, then you're rolling dice. Whereas in 5e, you roll dice a lot. Kind of giving you an example. Uh, say you, you defeat some baddie and you want to search the body. Maybe there's treasure. Maybe you've got you know, a key hidden somewhere. Well, in the old school way, you just basically tell the dungeon master, hey, you know where I'm going to rifle through their clothes, take their boots off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search them thoroughly. Well, if they had something hidden, you'd find it. Now, you're, uh, a player would just say, oh, I'm searching the body. And then they would uh, have the dungeon master normally rolling a perception check to see if they found it. Like I said, I prefer the old school way. That's just me. So I definitely dig a lot of what's in this first volume. That said, I do think that it is really overkill to have each and every printing of both modules reproduced in the book. This is a beefy tome to be utilizing at the table. It really, really is. So if you could cut down on the, the page count, you're not missing anything, right? You're not losing content. You're not losing gameable material by not including those other print runs of the modules. I get it. This is not necessarily only for uh, gamers to utilize. It is also kind of a collector's item as well. So I do understand that, but I'm looking at it from a Dungeon Master's point of view. Also, because this is not available in PDF, it is a little tougher to utilize maps and handouts. Not that we really have too many handouts in this volume. In fact, off the top of my head, I don't think there's any handouts, but there are plenty of maps. And it becomes a little difficult to utilize this at the table because you don't have a PDF where you could have printed out or had a tablet 
showing you those maps and things like that. And I get it. I understand it was part of the agreement, Goodman Games and Wizards of the Coast, that PDFs would not be available for the original Adventures reincarnated lineup of releases. I get it. I'm just saying it's a little more difficult to utilize at the table. Now, I've had somebody in chat during one of the live streams when we were taking a look at one of these volumes who had mentioned that they had been running one and what they were doing is they were taking photos of handouts or maps, player maps, what have you, and uh, ahead of time and then sending them to their players on their phones while they're at the table which is actually a pretty good idea. But on the flip side, I prefer not to have my players have their phones at the table when we're playing a role-playing game. So just some, you know, minor uh, quibbles that I do have. I think the biggest is that uh, I just think it's super overkill having all of those print runs reproduced. To me, it's silly. It really is silly. So... On a scale of 0 to 10, I give Volume 1 of Original Adventures Reincarnated into the Borderlands a very solid recommendation. I score this an 8.5 out of 10. I think it is that good. And I think if you really want to see the old school adapted for 5th edition, this is a good place to start. I think Goodman Games kicked off their line pretty well with this release. And they do make some changes along the way. And we will talk about those in future reviews as well. Okay, that is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when I upload videos, such as this review. It'll also inform you when my live stream, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. And don't forget, all throughout the month of January 2022, it is the old school for the New Year's celebration. So don't miss out. Of course, when you're not watching videos on The Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to give a peek to this video. And here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. See you next time. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. Check out the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch or find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks for watching.